Okay, so why is this thing I've written over here the identity operator? Well, basically, uh, any state psi we can write in terms of its wave function like that. So this is just another way of, of saying what I said before, which was, so let's see how that works, why that's the same. So if I take this inner product, so this gives a good example of the delta function. So this, from what I said before, this thing is the wave function psi of q prime. So how do we work that out? Well, we just take the inner product. So this state goes in here. This is just some integral. This is some function complex numbers. So basically, that goes through to here. So we have an integral dq psi of q. And then we have q prime q like that. This thing here gives us our delta function. And then we use this property up here. And so that when you substitute the delta function, it's exactly that integral there. And so the answer of that is psi of q prime. Okay, so these, this statement here is equivalent to this statement here. And now, so the way you can think about this is, this is an arbitrary state. You choose to write it out as a linear combination of some basis. So think of states as vectors. You choose some basis. I choose position eigenstates from a basis. And these are the components of the vector uh, when you write it in that basis. And obviously, the way you pick out components is picking vector dot products, which is all this inner product is. So why is the identity operator written like that? Well, that's what I said the identity operator was. Acting on some arbitrary state, then, we get this. But this thing here is just this inner product of q and psi. And that's just the wave function evaluated at position q. So this is just equal to integral dq. And then so, so this bit here is just psi of q, the wave function. And that's just a number, so I can write it anywhere in here I want. So I write it in there. And then we're still left with, with this bit here. But then we recognize, of course, that that's just what I wrote up here. So that is just the state psi. In other words, this operator, this thing here, acting in an arbitrary state psi, just gives you an arbitrary state psi. So that means it's the identity operator. So, so if you want, so perhaps I could have written. Okay, so that's just the definition of an op something acting on a state gives you the same thing back, then it's just the identity. So this is just a, a funny way of writing out the identity operator. Okay, um, well, actually, basically everything we've said so far covers basically all the background you'll need in quantum mechanics to understand the rest of these lectures. So I should just ask, are there some questions that anyone would like to, to ask just now about that? Okay, I mean, some of this will come up again, so if, if you think you understand it now, and then when it comes up again, you, you don't remember, then do just ask again. Okay, what were we doing here? We wanted to write this as a way of evaluating this amplitude here. So what we do is, so this is called the spectral representation for the identity operator. Now, the trick we're going to use is, because the identity operator doesn't change anything, then you can just stick the identity operator in anywhere you like. It's just like if you have a number, you can write it as one times that number. Or if you have a matrix or a vector, you can multiply by the unit matrix and you don't change your expression. The advantage is that rather than just putting it in, we can write it in this funny way, and then we get a different way of writing out things. So what we're going to do is essentially put 
in here, the identity, and stick in here, the identity. Okay, so, sorry, it's a bit messy. But that's not going to change our expression. I mean, I can, if I've got a product, I can stick in the identity uh, anywhere I want. So, Okay, so I'm going to choose, well, obviously I can just change my variable Q to any variable I like. So I'll call my variables QF and QI. Okay, so they're just, again, they're just two real variables I'm going to integrate over. And by putting the density in here, well, so the integrals I can just take out to the left. That's not a problem because they're just like summations. Okay, so I just, what I do is just write everything in the correct order. So the identity now follows after this F. And the identity is this expression here, but I'm going to use variable QF for that. So, okay, so that's just the state F here on the left, followed by the identity operator, if we ignore this integral here with the I. And then next thing that appears is this exponential. So it's E to the minus I over H bar h hat times t. Just, is my writing too small? Is, can everyone, is that okay at the back? Yeah, good. Okay. I'm still going to run out of board space, but <laughs> never mind. Uh, okay, and then we follow that again with the identity operator in here, and that's the one I'm going to use the, the variable qi for. So I've got my integral over qi, so I stick in this bit here with qi instead of q. So the first thing appears is this q I, and sorry, I will have to continue this on the next line. Okay, so if you can write it all in one line, great. Uh, QI, and then the last thing is the state I here. Okay, so that's a new way of writing that expression. Okay. So what use is that? Well, basically, the point is, whenever we have, so I should have said, whenever, when the vector is written this way, with the arrow pointing like that, that's called the ket vector, as I said. When it's written the opposite way around, with the arrow like that, it's called the bra vector. So it's just some sort of pun, because you take these inner products, you have a bra vector followed by a ket. So you have a bracket. Okay? So whenever you have one of these brackets, like this, that means you take the inner product, and that's a number. So that's, remember, this is just the component of one vector along another vector. So it's just a number. It's a complex number, but it's a number. Uh, so that's a number. This thing here is essentially a number, and this thing here is some number. So we split it up. We've got two integrals now, but we split it up into three separate pieces, which are multiplied together. And, well, that might not seem like a huge amount of progress since we just started with with the thing up here, of course, which was a single number. But now, what's the advantage of that? Well, the advantage is this thing here. This is just the wave function for the initial state. Uh, I should say, of course, this I here I'm always referring to as meaning initial. So don't confuse it with my operator, the identity operator. So this is just this inner product from what we've been saying over on this board here. This is just the wave function at qi, the initial wave function. So let's label it the subscript i. This one here, well, this is like the wave function psi f of qf. If the two things were the other way around, and there's a property of this inner product. The inner product in general gives you a complex number. If you write it the other way around, then it's the same as taking the complex conjugate. So what we say is this inner product is Hermitian, which means uh, if I had a QF followed by the capital F, that would be this wave function. And because I've written it the other way around, it gets complex conjugated. Okay, so this is just the initial wave function 
This is just the final wave function. So So if we specify these, because remember what we're asking was this had some state, initial state, evolved into some final state. So one way you can describe the initial state is by its wave function. One way to describe the final state is by its wave function. So these two bits are just some initial data and some final data that you want. Then what else do we need to calculate this? Well, we need to know this thing here. But apart from, well, but it doesn't depend on the initial or the final state. So this, for any problem of this sort you do, this bit in the middle is just the same for arbitrary QI and QF. We're always integrating over QI and QF. So it doesn't depend on the choice of your initial state or the choice of your final state. So it's a very general thing, this bit in the middle, to calculate. And this has a name, so Feynman propagator. Or also, it's often called the kernel. So it's given the name capital K. What does it depend on? Well, depends on some choice of initial position QI and some final position QF. And we see it also depends on the time in between them. So the way it's usually labeled is by the final time and then by the initial position, so final position and time and the initial position and time. Okay, so this is just notation for that thing I've written up there. QF e to the minus i over h bar h hat t QI. And just to emphasize then, Obviously, it depends on the Hamiltonian, but that's how you're describing your system. And well, basically. Uh, does depend on the initial and final times. In our examples, so I should say, I'm always assuming the Hamiltonian doesn't explicitly depend on time, and so, in fact, it only depends on the difference between initial and final times. So it doesn't matter whether I took the thing starting at time 7 to time 10 or starting at time 0 to time 3. But in general, uh, you can slightly generalize this. So it depends on the Hamiltonian and the initial and final times, but it does not depend on... the initial and final states. Because they're all encoded in these wave functions here. So to calculate the whole amplitude, of course, you need to know these. But this bit in the middle, this fine propagator, we don't need to know these. So it's, this is very general. 